speaker, if I may. Thank you. Okay. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Keith Ashley of the University of North Florida, and he's going to talk about indigenous life beyond the mission bell, excavations of the Mokama Indian community of Sarabe. And he's going to um, <clears throat> tell us a whole lot more about what, he's, uh, what they're accomplishing there. This is a 16th uh, century uh, Indian community um, with uh, Spanish contact. Um, I'm going to let him talk about that, but I want to tell you a little about him. He's an archaeologist and professor at the University of North Florida, and his current research focuses on indigenous peoples and histories of southeastern North America, particularly North Florida. He's actively involved in archaeological excavations with uh, University of North Florida students um, throughout the Northeast Florida area. He, uh, Keith Ashley uh, earned his a BA in, in Auburn, a BS from Florida State University and a PhD from University of Florida. His research is mostly in the Southeast from 4,000 year old shell middens on the Atlantic coast and 10th to 13th century fisher hunter gatherers to 16th and 17th century farmers. <clears throat> and he's interested in the long distance exchange systems demonstrating, demonstrated in his work here in Northeast, there in Northeast Florida and their connections across the Eastern US as far as the Mississippian period city of Cahokia, Illinois and beyond. I think that's probably enough. I'll shut up and let him take over. We welcome you, Keith Ashley. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, kind of talking about the research that we're doing here. So um, like Jack said, I'm um, in University of North Florida. If you're not familiar with that, that's Jacksonville, Florida. So we're up in the extreme Northeastern part of the state. And really, I do pretty much backyard archaeology. We're here working on the St. John's River, which is the main river system here in our area. And it basically dumps into the Atlantic Ocean at Mayport. So we're looking at sites that are really on the St. John's River estuary and then to the north on the Barrier Islands, so just Fort George. And then we have Big Talbot Island, Amelia Island. Then you get up into southeastern Georgia and Cumberland Island. So really, we're dealing with a lot of different terrain that's going to be different than you guys have up there really deep sandy deposits. Um, sometimes we got um, really acidic soils, so sometimes we have great preservation, but in shell middens we do. So two big areas that I'm really researching right now, I'm interested in really the long-term history, indigenous history of this area, which extends back like 13,000 years. But we have two kind of key keystones that we're focusing on. A thousand years ago, we're trying to look at the social geography of the Jacksonville area and the indigenous fisher hunter gatherers who are really making these contacts well beyond northeastern Florida. So Jack said we have artifacts that are coming from the Appalachian Mountains, Lena's coming from the Ozark Mountains. We actually have two, we think now three, Cahokia points here. So we have these fisher hunters and gatherers who are actively involved in these early Mississippian exchange networks. And the other time I'm looking at now is jumping ahead roughly about 500 years to European contact and trying to look at the indigenous groups who are here and how they kind of adapt to or change in the face of European contact, colonization, and missionization. So the site I'm gonna talk about today in the research today really focuses on probably the late 1500s into the early 1600s. We're really trying to look at where these villages and communities are and how they're interacting with uh, the European interlopers. All right, so, I want to start out just giving you guys some background on the indigenous group I'm going to talk about, so you may not be familiar with them, but this is going to be what we're going to call the Tumupul, all right? So what we have in terms of the first formal contact with them is in 1562. So this contact is by Jean Ribot, who's a Frenchman. So Jean Ribot has a lot of things named after him here in the Jacksonville area, but he is actually here for probably less than 48 hours. He's here, he reconnoiters the mouth of the St. John's River. He seems to interact with indigenous people on both the south and the north side of the river. Goes you know, down the river, up the river, just a short distance, and then heads back out and goes up and establishes the first French community, which is gonna be on Paris Island, South Carolina. So that kind of flops. And eventually his second in his command, his name is um, Laudonniere, Rene Laudonniere. He comes back in 1564 and they're gonna establish a colony now. So now two years later, they meet the Tumupu who they had come to see the first time 
and they are scouting out an area for a short-lived colony. So this colony here uh, is only the last 15 months. If you come to the Jacksonville area, it's part of the national park system. It's known as Fort Caroline. Um, so it's here. And during this time, they kind of interact with the local Tamuka groups. And what we get is when a couple instances, they refer to the Timagona. So the local indigenous groups are talking to the French and there's a lot of misunderstandings and miscommunications going on. They keep saying this word Timagona, Timagona. And the French apparently think that this is their name for themselves. So this word right here, Timagona, gets corrupted into Tamuka. Uh, but it really is probably the name of a chief who's living further kind of up the river, which is south for the St. John's River. And they're basically wanting the French to help them to maybe attack Demagona. So sometimes this has been translated as meaning enemy in Tamuqua, but that's not the case. It's probably an individual's name. And this is where we get the word, word Tamuqua. But really, Tamuqua is a language. It's not necessarily a group. So it's this language that's really spoken by many different groups over really, really broad areas. So you can see in this map, it's most of northern peninsular Florida, over to where the panhandle of Florida starts, then up into southeastern Georgia. So what we see here are different groups that are here. They speak different dialects of Tamuqua. They have different kind of polity structures that are there. So what you have are probably five, seven communities, villages that kind of unite together under one leader to form what most people call chiefdoms. And these are kind of scattered throughout this broad Tamuqua territory. So there was no one Tamuqua leader that controlled this. These different kind of Tamuqua chiefdoms, some of them were engaged in really great alliances with one another, very peaceful. Others were actually really pretty volatile and there was a lot of warfare that went on uh, among them. So this dialect of Tamuqua is actually called Mokama here. So Mokama is an indigenous word and Mokama means sea, S-E-A, so sea or ocean. So Mokama is considered to be kind of the maritime dialect of the Tamuqua language. And it differs from the Tamuqua language that's spoken to the south of us in the St. Augustine area. That's the Agua Salada or the saltwater dialect. So there were two kind of coastal dialects of Tamuqua, Mokama and Agua Salada. And then Oconee, you see Oconee up in here, that's probably gonna be the Okefenokee swamp area. So we have these different dialects. The main dialect was here in the center area is called Tamuqua. So really after European contact, the Spanish start referring to our area as Mokama, and they tend to use the word Tumuqua as an area or as a group for more of the Gainesville and to the north of them, okay? But Tumuqua is the language that they all, they all speak. So if you hear me saying Mokama, it's Tumuqua. We just try to use that sometimes with a little bit more specificity. We know that Mokama is basically spoken from just south of the St. John's River up into probably Cumberland Island and up to into the Satila River in terms of um, uh, Georgia. Uh, just a couple of real background things to kind of take away about the Tamuqua. You're probably going to be familiar with them. They, they'll fit into kind of a late Mississippian version. Um, they definitely have hereditary leaders. There is going to be social inequality among them. So we do see these rank clans that are there uh, and that the Leaders in the community seem to come from certain clans. So we do have this. Uh, we also know that they are living in villages at this time. This can be different compared to earlier periods in time here. What we see in Northeast Florida is at times we may have these sedentary communities, but then they kind of break up and they become a little bit more mobile. So there's more residential mobility. Then they kind of come back together. So we see this kind of coming back, this coalescing occurring about 1450. So around 1450, the Tamuk or the Makama that the French and the Spanish encounter, I think really start to come into their, their being at that time. And the other thing is, there's still strongly fisher folks and shellfish collectors, but they've started to add corn farming. And what's interesting, we've done a lot of dating now actually on corn and we've taken Cobmark pottery and got soot off of that. And we're pretty confident now in all the, all the radiocarbon dates that we have, when we look at the two standard, two sigma deviation, we're looking at corn not being introduced into this area until 1450. So corn's a really late addition. Because every, every say 14 day we have, when we look at that 98% kind of a probability, 
the earliest it is, is 1450. So really when Juan Ponce arrives in Florida in 1513, these coastal tulipas have only been growing corn for, for decades. Um, a couple of things too, we know now uh, a lot of their terminology. What we see is there is a lot of Tumuqua text now that Aaron Broadwell from the University of Florida is really going through. So we're really starting to learn a lot of their words, uh, which we've kind of known about, but I think he's going at it in a much more systematic way that's producing, I think, really more robust results. So we know that Hulata was named for like the lead chief. So when the Europeans first arrived, there were two main chiefs, Satariba or Satariwa, who was here in the Jacksonville area, and Takata Karu. And Takata Karu was based in, on the Georgia side. So Takata Karu was probably at the south end of Cumberland Island. So he was there in the National Park Service property that's there. So we know that there are seven ranked clans among the Tamuqua. We know that the deer clan seemed to be the most prominent and the leaders of Holatas usually were drawn from that clan, all right? Uh, we see that there was each of these towns had a Holata or a chief, but they also had a village council that helped, I think, temper the absolute power of these chiefs. So these chiefs really didn't have overwhelming power, but they did have some degree of control over their community plus allied communities. All right, and they were able to extract tribute. We see this now in uh, a lot of the accounts. So there is some degree of control over other villages. And then what's probably cementing these villages together is going to be you know, relations of kinship and marriage. So what we see at these local levels is really tight integration. They're peaceful, they're getting along well, but beyond these river valleys at times, they can have really good allies but that at times they can be in kind of these raiding situations with other Tamuqua speakers. All right, so I just want to give you kind of just a quick background there, kind of on who the Tamuqua are, who the Mokama are, you know, in the late 1400s into the 15 and 1600s. So, like I said, the French here are here in 1562. They come back in 1564. They have the community of La Caroline or Fort Caroline for 15 months. Things really are going miserable for them. They're actually packing up, they're dismantling the fort, and they're ready to leave. But right before that happens, there's a supply ship, a French supply ship, that comes basically with orders from France saying, hey, no, we're going to stick it out here. But at the same time, just days later, the Spanish arrive. So what ends up happening is there's a storm. The Spanish basically get caught in that storm. The French eventually, I mean, the French get caught in that storm. The Spanish eventually take over Fort Caroline. So what a lot of people don't realize is that Fort Caroline is this French garrison for 15 months, but then it is a Spanish garrison for four more years. So the French kind of take it over and they rename it San Mateo. So what we have now is a Spanish fort from 1565 to 1569, right there in the heart of the Mocama area. All right, and what we really start to see from 1565, 66 into the 1570s is almost a, a war between the Mokama and the Spanish who are there. At times the Spanish are kind of prisoners within their own kind of fort. Uh, eventually things happen during the 1570s and 80s. We're not sure about because that's a time that's really mute within the Spanish records, but something does happen. By 1587, we start to see missionization among, among the Mokama. So we start to see Spanish missions throughout northern Florida into southeastern Georgia, then across to the Panhandle area. So I just wanted to give you just a brief background on missions. I think a lot of time when people think of mission, they think of California, they think of the Alamo in Texas, they think of the Southwest. But in reality, the mission system was actually larger and much earlier here in La Florida than it was in California. And I think a lot of times people don't think about missions being in our area is because their, their churches and their other buildings are made out of perishable materials. In the Southwest, you know, they're made out of, they're made out of adobe or some sort of uh, sandstone. In the California, they're, you know, they're, they're masonry. So they, these things have survived the ravages of time. Here they have it. All right, so what we have is when missionization really begins in earnest, which was with the Franciscans in 1587, what we're going to see is what's going to become ground zero for the early French and the early Spanish colonization is Northeast Florida and Georgia coast. 
they are going to bear the brunt of this initial wave of French and Spanish colonization. So what we're going to see is these areas will be hit by either people moving away from the area or some people dying off because of diseases, but they do, they do make it through this. So what we'll see is we have our Mokama here. We have our broader Tumuqua speakers here. We have the Wally who are along the North Georgia coast. And then we have the Appalachia over here who are in the Tallahassee area. So these are going to be the main groups that are subject to or are involved with uh, missionization to various degrees. So what we have here is kind of showing you where it is. So 1587, we see the Franciscans really began along the Atlantic coast and it's primarily focusing on the Mokama and the Wally. And also you're gonna see some with the Agua Salada Saloy down here in the St. Augustine area. 1607, they start to move west. So by 1607, they're into the Tumuqua area. And then by 1633, they're into the Appalachia area. The Appalachia area is kind of true Mississippi, and they're growing incredibly large amounts of corn. We get corn here after 1450, but we really don't get large amounts of it. So they're growing it, but it's nothing like we're going to see in Appalachia. All right, so that's kind of the general mission structure that's out here in the time frame. One more thing about missions. I think a lot of times people will think, oh, they build the mission and then the, the Indians come to the mission. And that's not how they do it in La Florida. In La Florida, they're going to take advantage of the existing indigenous settlement system. So what they do is they are eventually going to find a larger community, kind of a capital community uh, within an area. And usually they're asked to come into that area. So the priest will then come into that community and start to live there. So it's an existing Native American community. So he'll move into that. He'll build a church with the help of all the indigenous people within that community. And then there'll be a small convento or friary that he'll be living in. All right. So this is kind of what it looks like. This is a, a drawing from San Luis. So what you would have here would be the council house, which is the existing indigenous council house. It stays. And what's interesting throughout the entire mission period, at all of these main mission sites, that council house is still a fixture of them. So they still have a major say in the politics of their area. So usually nearby are going to be where the elites are living. There's a plaza area. And then across from that will be the one priest that's living there, okay, and then a church. So a lot of times when we talk about these missions, there's usually only one Spaniard in that whole community. So when I start talking about Jacksonville, and start talking about one of the missions here and the nine satellite communities, there is only one Spaniard in that whole area. And then the other Spaniard would be on Cumberland Island. Then you may have in the early 1600s, maybe a couple hundred people in St. Augustine. So this is still strongly an indigenous landscape. So we need to kind of keep that in mind. And that's really what we're trying to look at through our excavations right now. All right, so, we have these missions that are established, okay? So that priest comes in, builds that community there, and he's living there. In Spanish parlance, that's referred to as a doctrina or mission. So what will happen is from that doctrina, from where he's living, he will go out and kind of visit the nearby communities. And those in Spanish parlance are called visitas. He visits them. So he'll go to evangelize among them, baptize them, entice them to come to the missions. So they're usually within his circuit, all right? The site I we're gonna talk about is a deceit. But in reality, if you went there, an indigenous community, all right? Uh, they're told that they may have a small little open chapel that may have been built at some of these, particularly ones that are far from him, that if he comes and visits, he would say a mass or something like that. But they really start to expect these outlying people to come to either whether it's a holy day or whether it's a Sunday service, to come to the main doctrine or mission, right? So that's kind of the basic structure of how it works in really simplistic terms. So let me give you a really, really quick history of them among the Mokama. So 1587, they're asked to come into two communities. One is going to be the community of Alamakani, which is right here at the mouth of the St. John's River, where I am, where I am and that becomes mission of San Juan del Puerto. Okay. At the same time, they're invited into a community of Mokama that are on Cumberland Island, Katakaru. Okay, that becomes San Pedro de Mokama. So right now, 1587 into the 1590s, you have 
two Spanish missions among the Makama and probably two Spaniards living among them. That's it. Okay, the rest are going to be a small little colony down 35, 40 miles south of us in St. Augustine. What happens by the first decade of the 1600s, they open up two more missions among the Makama. One here is right in the middle. It's Santa Maria. Keep Santa Maria in mind. This is going to become what's known today as Amelia Island. Then they have one way to the north. And this is San Buenaventura de Gualaquín. And this is at the south end of St. Simons Island, Georgia. I don't think Mokama are normally that far north. I think they moved them up into this area or they moved there after the Wally Rebellion of the Wally War of 1597. So that might be a little north of where their normal kind of um, territory was. But this is a Tamupla community. Every time the priests come to record something, the Spanish come to record something, they always list who their translator is and what language that translator speaks. And Gualakini is always a Tamuqua translator. So right now then you have four missions. Early on surrounding these missions would have been these scores of you know, Mokama communities that, that would have been called Visitas. Quickly, those Visitas are gonna disappear, okay? They're gonna disappear one of two things. Either people are just leaving this area, some of them may be dying out. Others then will just start moving to the missions themselves. All right, so they start to contract. If we would jump up now to 1655. San Pedro on Cumberland Island, Georgia, they leave and the, the, some of them appear to leave completely, but the rest move down to Santa Maria. So now we have three. By 1665, those who are at Santa Maria move to San Juan del Puerto. So now, 1665, we have two Spanish missions that are Mokama. They're going to be ones north of this with the Wally, so keep that in mind. All right, so now we have two missions that are here. But once they establish Charlestown, the English did, they begin raiding Spanish missions. So what we see, the Spanish kind of presses San Buenaventura to move, to be safer. And they initially, they want them to move in with San Juan del Puerto. So they want them to come to San Juan del Puerto. So this is 1684. What they say is, no, no, we want to maintain our own autonomy. We'll move, but we're not going to move in with them. We want our own chiefs to lead us. So they move to a nearby island. So now we have two Mokama communities. There are no Visitas. So now any Mokama who are here are in one of these two communities. And what we will see 12 years later, they're all going to move into San Juan del Puerto. So by 1696, all those Mokama now are reduced to this one community of San Juan del Puerto. All right, some of them have moved to the interior, some have gone. So, but in terms of us having Mokama here, they're now at San Juan del Puerto. What will happen is slave raiders from, which will include indigenous people from South Carolina will basically destroy this. So in 1702, San Juan del Puerto is destroyed. The indigenous people who are there get out and go to San Augustine. They're gonna come back and try to reestablish things five years later. So this area right here that I'm talking about, this is the area that's been consistent the whole time. And this is really where we are working. Um, we've worked on it and it's a great site, got great stuff to talk about. Santa Cruz right here, we found that site and we've, uh, it's a National Park Service property. We've got a structure out there. We've got all this really great stuff coming out of there. So it, it was only in existence for 12 years, 1684 to 1696. So it was great. It gives us a really 12 year snapshot of what's going on in this area at that specific time. All right, so with that real quick mission history, let's go back to 1602. We're gonna start turning our attention now to where we are in the time period we're dealing with. So if we backtrack to 1602, the Spanish have started their missions in this area in 1587. So what we're talking about, this is 14 years after they've started missionization. Okay, there is a priest at Alamacani which is San Juan del Puerto. He writes the letter that we we have and it's been translated. And basically this letter is state of affairs. This is what's going on at the community that I'm living in, San Juan del Puerto. So he talks a little bit about that. He talks about how, hey, there are people who are leaving here and there are other people who are from the interior of Georgia are actually coming in and visiting and some are staying. So there's really dynamic kind of fluid in and out of people at this time. But he also says, from my doctrina, I proselytize where I go out and preach to nine surrounding communities. 
So he mentions their name and he gives us an idea of how far they are in leagues. Leagues is a hard term to really pinpoint because there's a Spanish league, a French league, it can change over time. There's a terrestrial league, there's a, uh, a water league and all this. So we're probably looking at, you know, two and a half to three and a half miles, somewhere in there. But in looking at this, he says the ones closest to him, and we know where he is. He's on San Juan del Puerto, which we know for a fact is Fort George Island. In fact, we know where that mission church is. So the closest one to him is a place called Cerebe. So if we go back to the French, when they're here, the French in a couple instances mentioned one time, oh, the corn at Cerebe, even though they say mill, they don't have a word for corn, so mill becomes their term, which is grain. And it's ripening at Cerebe. In another letter, they mentioned, the French mentioned, oh, we go near a village of Cerebe to get clay for bricks. So we see it kind of mentioned. They talked about, oh, there was this, this meeting among the Tamuqua kings in this area, and King Cerebe was there. So we know it's mentioned. It's mentioned that it's on an arm of the main river to the north, which is what it is. It's on the barrier island just north of the St. John's River. So we have a general idea of where it is, both based on the French and now with the Spanish here. So let's look at this somewhat modern map, so hopefully you can follow it. So here is the mouth of the St. John's River. This right here, if you've been to Jacksonville, this is the Mayport Naval Station. So this is Fort George Island. This is Big Talbot Island. Over here is Black Hammock Island. Just to the north here would be Amelia Island, and then north of that would be in the Cumberland Island, Georgia. So we've done various work out here over the past 20 years or so. So Alamakani, which is right here, this is what becomes San Juan del Puerto. So this was a contact village that eventually invites the priests in, and he's going to live there, and that's going to become San Juan del Puerto. This is Cerebe, which is where we're working now. We feel really confident in Cerebe. Here's Guadalquini in the green right here. This is the one that moved from St. Simon's Island that was here for 12 years, okay? When it moves down here, its name changes to Santa Cruz. And the reason it probably changes is there had been an earlier Mokama community here called Vera Cruz. So John Worth has said a lot of times Santa Cruz and Vera, they are sometimes used interchangeably. So they probably changed Guadalquini's Spanish name to Santa Cruz once they moved into this area, which was known as Vera Cruz. So this was also a contact village, Veracruz was, and a Basita, and we've done some excavations there. And then there are two more on the south side of the river, San Mateo and San Pablo. So we really feel somewhat confident. We know where four of those nine Basitas that he mentions in 1602. Uh, we have other places too that we think are contact villages or Basitas. We're just not sure which ones they are, are and we really don't want to force a name on them. All right. So. We have Alamakani, which is right here, which has been excavated. And then we have Gualakini, which is the later mission here. And then we have these Vesitas that we know about. So Cerebe, on this next island to the north, that's where we are. And what we're probably looking at is 1580, 1620 range. So it's going to be at the earlier end of what's going on. It's going to be when there's one priest living here, and there's probably eight or nine outlying communities. All right. Just a couple other things to reinforce Cerebe. This is a great, great map. So this map probably dates to about 1704. So this map is after, remember there, I said that just San Juan del Puerto was the only mission there and it was raided by slave raiders from the Carolina colony. Well, right after they abandoned that, this map is drawn. So this map right here, this is the mouth of the St. John's River, which it says, this island right here says where San Juan del Puerto was. So we know that that is Big Talbot Island. On this one right here, it says this is Santa Maria Island where the mission Santa Maria was. And we know for a fact that that's Amelia Island. Then right here in the center is the Isle of Cerebe. And the only island that could be is the island of Big Talbot Island. We also know that in 1609, a Spanish pilot, navigating pilot, left St. Augustine and went all the way up to Chesapeake Bay. And as he did it, he recorded all the sounds, the inlets and the islands. And he also refer refers to this island here as Cerebe. So that really does give us really stronger support that the island we're on is Cerebe. We've done work on the island. This is the only Mokama community time period on the island. 
Um, what is interesting here is when they talk about this, they talk about this community. So after they come through, they destroy the mission, some Okama come back up and establish this short-lived community right here called Pilihiriva. So this is probably the last indigenous community in Jacksonville area. It only lasts a couple of years. They plan to build a big fort here, but, th but they never do. Uh, they come back, they stay a couple of years, and then they move back to the St. Augustine area. All right, so that kind of gives you some background on the missions, Mokama, all those kinds of uh, important contextual information. So let's start looking now at the, at the archaeology uh, we've done and we're doing. So we're going back to Big Talbot Island, okay, the island that they call Sarah Bay. Since 1998, we've done a series of projects out there. The ones in yellow are really kind of highlighting what I'm talking about today in Sarah Bay. Uh, this Grand Shell Ring is a great site at the same time period as Mill Cove, 1000 AD. We found some great stuff there. Uh, but I want to talk about what we found here at these Armelino site, which we think is Sarah Bay. So we got it 98, 99, 20, then we got 21, and we're currently out there right now uh, working. We got about two or three more weeks uh, to go. All right. So Nice little aerial map here. Uh, where if I'm moving my cursor, that's the mouth of the St. John's River. This is Fort George Island. It used to have a golf course out there when this was taken. So those are all greens and fairways and things like that. Uh, that's all reverted to secondary uh, growth. So this now is part National Park Service and part state lands. San Juan del Puerto is right here. Okay, the community of Alamacani. This is Big Talbot Island. This is Black Hammock Island. So that relocated mission is right over here. That Veracruz Visita is right over here. And this is where Sarah Bay is gonna be, all right? This island here is a little tall, but this was not an island when the Spanish and French were here. This was probably a sand spit. It's only really started to form in the last few hundred years. So here's the south end of the island right here. Not much had been done on the island. Uh, what people had done, what we called, I guess in the 60s and early 70s, windshield survey, they drive down dirt roads, kind of look out the windshield, see if they could find anything on the ground. And so they found some things in either kind of cleared areas or in roadway, dirt roadways. And so they've recorded some things here. I need to acknowledge that William Jones, who was a local educational archeologist in the 1960s, came out and there used to be a dirt road going right in through here. He found a piece of majolica and he said Indian pottery. And he, he was more interested in the plantation era, the 17 and 1800s, but he made a comment saying, oh, this might be related to that cerebate that that priest talked about. And I think he's absolutely right. So uh, this is something that really the seeds for are with William Jones in the uh, 1960s. So really what you have is a couple of dirt roads coming through here. A couple of things have been found, but really no systematic work. We have a couple of out parcels, but the rest of this land all belongs to the state of Florida. So in 1998, I had quit my CRM job and I was getting ready to start uh, the doctor program at Florida, but I worked with Buzz Tuna, who was at the University of North Florida at the time to start working on this project. So I kind of handled the field work of it. So what we did was we decided, let's do shovel testing. Let's find out what is in this area. It's heavily overgrown. We really can't see anything on the surface. So what we did is we saturated it with shovel tests every 25 meters. So in Florida, a, sh a shovel test is 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. And sometimes these can go a meter deep. We have really sandy soils. Sometimes we'll hit the water table before then or a hard pan, depending on the soil conditions, the elevations. And sometimes it can go as deep as a meter. So we started to dig this. So what we started to realize is with this uh, um, open one means it's negative for indigenous you know, Indian pottery or Indian artifacts. So what we see here, are some different sites here. We got the shell ring right over here, which dates to 1000 AD. And there is a dirt road that runs right down the middle of it. And what's interesting is that most of the deposits that are on the east side of that dirt road, they, they're St. John's too, they date to about 1000 AD. And those on the west side of the road date more from 1250 up into European contact. And then there's some uh, plantation, American plantation era stuff here. So what we're gonna start seeing is this area here it's going to have all those artifacts that are 1500s and 1600s. And that's kind of what we're interested in right now, even though we've done work at the other sites as well. So 
these are a couple major players in what's going on. So I want to just kind of identify them real quick. Uh, first of all, I do not think pots are people, but they can become great temporal markers for us. And when we have them in large quantities, we say, hey, this could be some sort of larger community, small amounts of them. Maybe this is more of a campsite. So we now know that San Pedro is the pottery that they're making or the Mokama are making. They're beginning to make it at about 1450 and then they continue to make it into the 1600s. It's grog tempered. A lot of its surface decorations are usually some sort of roughened surface, either some sort of fabric, textile, but they're also starting to use corn cobs. So these are corn cobs without the kernels on them and they press them into the wet clay and it leaves this real roughened surface to it. So this is the same time we start to see corn in the archeological record for the first time here in our area. All right, then what we start to see is a major shift in pottery. Really, it's a wholesale shift to San Marcos. And this is kind of interesting. If I if we were talking about this 30 years ago, we would probably say, oh, this San Pedro is what the Mokama are making. But then these Wally Indians from Georgia move in with their San Marcos pottery. So in Georgia, San Marcos is called Altamaha. In Florida, we call it San Marcos. It has something to do with history uh, of archaeology, but they're really the same wear. So what we're going to see here with this um, San Marcos or Altamaha pottery, it may look really similar to you guys because it probably origins are within Lamar. So it's kind of Lamar kind of pottery, but on the Georgia coast, it's referred to as Irene. All right. So that Irene pottery kind of changes shortly after contact into what is now Altamaha or what we call San Marcos. But what we see is that same thing, probably a decade or two later, happens among the Mokama and then the Yamasee. So by 1640, you have the Yamasee, the Eskimaku, the Mokama, and the Wali all making this Altamaha San Marcos pottery. So it's hard to really equate it with, you know, one ethnic group being made by many. And this is supported really by um, documents because San Juan del Puerto, which is the Mokama mission, every time a translator went there, it was always Mokama, never ever changed, okay? It's always Mokama or Tamukwa, but what you start to see is a lot of San Marcos pottery. So we know that they're shifting their pottery to it. Uh, so you get this kind of central dodge based on the fill foot cross, even though that curvilinear part of the fill foot cross really drops out in um, San Marcos and Altamaha. So those are the really the two main types of pottery that help us to say, hey, you're looking at the late 1500s into the 1600s. All right, so this is an old kind of distribution map. So with all those shovel tests, okay, we started looking at, okay, where are their concentrations of San Marcos and San Pedro? It gives an idea, where can the core part of this community be? So in doing that, we noticed that there is an existing cemetery here, and there's a really a nice concentration here, but we see it really over a broad area. So we decided in 1998, okay, Let's use this shovel test information and try to open up some larger areas. I mean, what can you see in a 50 by 50 centimeter unit? All right, so we're gonna focus on this area right here. So you can see this little blue tarp here. This is our shovel test. So we dug a shovel test. And when we noticed that we got below the plow zone, we had a nice little stain that covered a lot of it. So we didn't wanna do too much with that stain because it just seemed out of place. So we decided, okay, we're gonna backfill it with the tarp and we'll come back and dig a larger one by two. So what we're gonna do is dig this larger one by two, which is not big enough. But what we're gonna see over the next two years, we're gonna dig a larger block, all right? So from this one by two, we start to cobble together more and we end up digging these blocks in 98, calling it A and 99, calling it B. So now we have a much broader horizontal area to look at. So a couple of things. Here is that shovel test right here. What we hit was part of a wall trench. And what we're going to see here, this F6 is a complete vessel. So had this shovel test been moved right over here, we would have missed the vessel and we would have missed the wall trench. And we would probably would not be digging where we're digging here. So there is definitely luck involved in what we have here. But so this is the block. And so now this is like your bird's eye view. You're looking down a plan view of everything that we're seeing here feature wise, whether they're natural or cultural, you know, below the plow zone. So we have this these arc here of really kind of pits. We have posts that are in there. Uh, we have this wall trench. 
And I think you can still see it here. Can you see it kind of coming around right here? And there's where we hit it with the shovel test. We caught that big stain in there. We think this is gonna be a doorway into it right here. All right, so in this area right here, probably leaning up against the inside wall. So this structure would have kind of gone like this. We couldn't really do anymore because there's a giant oak tree right over in this area. But this is what was in, right next to that shovel test in the inside wall. This is a complete vessel with a gynoonic cockle shell. And what happens is, so during the 1800s, there's plowing going on. A plow hit this, and you can see the shirts kind of scattered. So this part here was intact, but this part here was scattered. So what you can see, it's a great looking uh, uh, San Marcos or Altamaha vessel with these kind of hollow tool punctations, a lot of people call them a, a cane, or it could be a bird bone. And then this was inside of it. And this is this really large, it's called a giant Atlantic cockle. And there's a hole in it. And that hole is not a predator hole. You can look at it close up, you can see it etched in its square. And the etching goes beyond the square. So it's clearly a hole that they made in it. In the area we are, uh, we, we found corn. So we have radiocarbon dates now on corn, uh, soot off San Marcos and San Pedro pottery. Uh, we have uh, charcoal from these posts that I'll show you later. All of it seems to really be pre-1630. So we're probably looking at this, again, 1580, 1620 range. Oh, we're getting other, you know, this, this is still 98, 99. We had other nice little posts that were here, little nice little post molds. Another one here. Uh, here's a larger pit behind it. You see there's a couple of huge sherds sticking out of it. So we really had this little structure. Uh, wall trench structures are unusual for our area. So that was something really kind of different. Um, we found, and I'll show it later, we found part of a Spanish scabbard, brass scabbard tip. So it would have been at the end of either a dagger sheath or a um, um, sword. Uh, we have some handwrought nails. We have some uh, Spanish artifacts as well. All right. So this is what we dug. This is that block that we dug in 1998 and 99. So that would be kind of the structure that we dug. So we, we got this much of it right here and then we project it out here. So that's 1999. Um, I go on and start working on other projects. Come 2018, I started to think about what does a Mokama, really a contact village look like? We have kind of glimpses of it and, you know, kind of biased, you know, um, descriptions, really vague descriptions by the Spanish and French. So let's do, let's find a good candidate, go out there and open really broad areas so we can start to see what these sites really look like. So I chose Cerebe. I remembered it from 1989. It never left my mind. So we came back out. So we come out in 2020. We're getting ready to start. 2020 in the summer and the pandemic hits, uh, the school has enabled us to teach, to have a small scale version of it in the fall with fewer students, uh, socially distanced, wearing masks, so we're out there working on it. So 20 meters away, we're digging a new area. Now, when we dug this one here in 1998-99, there was a shell midden over here. So these little orange ones, they were dug at the same time as these. So what we decided to do, let's go relocate those ones we dug in the mid and, and kind of open that up. This is really before we had handheld GIS uh, and GPS and all of that. So I had a bunch of flags and other measurements that were out there, they were all gone. So we had estimated, and I thought that this was going to be right about here. So I was a few meters off, it was right there, but finding it was great. That let us know, now we know exactly where we are. So we opened this area. So we're out there in 2020, trying to open up this broader area with the, the small limited crew uh, that we had. So these are just photos of us out there working. So what you can see here in these is we have this darker kind of midden and plow zone. And then when we get below that, we get this really sandy soil that's kind of this light yellow brown. And then we're looking for these stains within it. And some of these stains, you know, when we're not sure what they're gonna be when we first find them, we report them, draw them in plan. They may end up being uprooted trees, uh, rodent burrows, uh, or they could be something cultural. So we're out there now kind of troweling, uh, drawing, and then profiling and excavating these feet. All right. Uh, I'll tell you about the results of that after we get all of these. So over here, 98, 99, right there, that one there was what we did in 2020. And then we come out in 2021. 
We had an extension here to the north. We had another block here and another smaller block here and an isolated one here, okay? So now we're trying to see even a broader area. So this area right in here, this is what we dug the previous year. So this has already been excavated and backfilled. This is our expansion area right here. So you're looking north going this way. Here I'm standing this way and we're looking back at it here. So we're starting to really open up these broader areas, hoping to find really place-making features, hoping to find pits, post molds, or holes, those types of things. All right. So here our students were kind of getting down, trying to expose that interface, that intersection between the plow zone and our really sandy subsoil to see what we can find. All right. So this is kind of the plan view map. So down here is our I'm just focusing on this one block. Remember, there's another block over here and one up at the top. So we have this lower one here that is dug in 2020, this upper one here in 2021. We kept a really thin little bulk between them, but we eventually do take that out. And so this is all the kind of stuff that we see in plan. You know, there's a lot of background noise, dips in the file zone, all different kinds of things. But what really stands out, and I want to show you here, is this alignment of posts that we have. And we've actually bisected all these. So there's one there, there's one there, 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 there. So that's it. Now we're out there right now expanding. And I can tell you right now, we have that one, that one, and that is a third one. So we now have, you can't see it here, but there's one there and then one there and another one. So we have three more there. We're currently working on this area right here to try to get more of it. So this is going to have a, in a diameter of 50 more, maybe closer to 60 feet. And there are a couple references to council houses among um, the Tamuqua, and one of them says uh, 50 feet. Uh, I'm not saying it's a council house yet, but we have something going on. Uh, this is below the 18th, 19th century plow zone. All we're getting in is indigenous pottery in this area. We have a couple more on the outside. So we got this really great, great alignment of these large posts. Um, and he, this is just a few samples of them here, just to show you. They're really deep, nice and round. Uh, they stand out. They're definitely not trees or anything else. Students down in here are kind of, um, uh, you know, cross-sectioning them. So usually what it is, we'll draw them in plan. We'll take one half out, field screen it, and then we'll take the second half out, ream it out in its, in its contour, and save that for a fine mesh screen. And then we have a nice little fire pit that's down here as well, solid charcoal. So we have these other kind of features that are out here. So what we're hoping is that it's going to be some sort of really large, we're hoping it's a large communal council house. So we're hoping we're getting these upright posts here. We are gonna to try to do some stuff in the that center once we get an idea of the diameter to see if we can get some interior support posts. There are also supposed to have these large central fires or so we're gonna get some maybe thermally altered sand and charcoal, things like that within the center. So that's part of our long-term project here. Uh, this is a reconstruction of the really incredibly large one that's at San Luis in Tallahassee, which is a state park. So I think we have some sort of large building and we're hoping it's a council. So what we should have here would be the structure that we found here in 1998-99. This one here that we're projecting out here for 2020, 2021, and 2022. Uh, what is interesting, we shovel testing that's done over here, there's hardly anything over here. So I'm curious is, could this be a potential plaza area? Uh, so these are things we're still going to try to um, um, to deal with in the, in the future. Uh, to give you an idea of this area, so this area is 60 meters by 40 meters. To give you the idea of how much uh, we've dug. So if you took a two meter, a six foot wide trench, we've dug that trench the length of the football field probably even longer than that, probably from the back end zone on one end to the back end zone on the other end. So we really covered a lot of area. And I think that's the only way we can really identify parts of the community. So uh, I'm gonna end here with just kind of showing you some of the artifacts uh, that we have. We're still working on the retort and things along those lines. This is our San Pedro pottery. Aesthetically is not the most you know pleasing stuff to look at. It tends to have these really, really roughened surfaces that are either going to be made with fabric, cob, uh, other you know other types of roughened surface. Sometimes they come back and they'll they'll still obliterate it or they'll swipe it 
and smooth certain areas of it. And we see this among the Potano speaking Tanuku in the interior as well. So that's our San Pedro pottery, 1450 to sometime in the early 1600s. Then we get our San Marcos pottery that's gonna be sometime after 1600. So here you can see kind of the raised dot area. Uh, this would be kind of your block line blocking. There's incising here. I think this has a really strong Irene look to it. These are just cross stamping here. Again, here's some more a really prevalent rim treatment is this hollow tool, whether it's cane or whether it's a bird bone, whatever it might be to produce that, that design. So we're getting some really nice size, some nice pieces here. Um, we're also seeing that they're still using traditional kinds of, of uh, tools. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, we don't have stone in our area. We have no stone sources here. All the stone limestone that we have are hundreds of feet down. There's no access to it. So they're gonna have to bring stone in from other areas. So they take advantage of the shell that's here. So we get a lot of whelk uh, tools that can be really heavy and robust for various types of pounding. You see these are art shells that can be used for weights. This is a whelk cayumela right here. This is the center part of the whelk right here. They cut them and make beads. We have several beads that are out of it. This one here, they're getting ready to do something. They have a series of holes within it. These are clams that sometimes they can be used almost in a spoke shape kind of fashion here. So we have really nice set of shell tools and this is a small collection of them. Uh, we do have a few um, stone tools. So we get these small little true points which would be, we call them Pinellas points which are probably true arrowheads. We have this Marion point. So this is archaic. So this is a much earlier period in time but it was found within a very sealed uh, late 15th, early 16th century context. So they had really found this themselves and salvaged it. Uh, really, there is nothing this early at the south end of the island. So this is brought in and being utilized. Uh, we got a few other pieces of stone. We just found this gigantic stone, which we're thinking might actually be ship ballast. So I'm trying to get a geologist to look at it now. So we got a small collection of stone, but this is normal for most of our sites in this area since we lack stone. Um, we're getting Kelowna wares. So Kelowna wares are gonna be made by indigenous women, but they're gonna be made in European vessel form. So they're seeing these European vessel forms and they're emulating. So what we start to see are large like water pitchers and these water pitcher of the handles. We'll see kind of mugs and mug handles. We'll start to see plates and these plates have these kind of brimmed rims and they're, they're kind of beat plates. And the, around the red, around the brim part is this really red uh, slipping. So we see these here, here's another handle that's here. These are these plate marlies that are red film. So those are really great. Uh, these are not clone aware, but we have these two tobacco pipes. Uh, this one here, I'm talking to Dennis Blanton about it. And this would have been uh, a Sitka version that this is, uh, that would have been a human face on this. So this is the back part where the stem comes in. That would be the ear. There's like an uh, ear plug and the face would be around. We're missing the face. This one here, we have the front part of it. Nice little spur there, but it's got this nice little uh, kind of concentric kind of square design uh, to it. Getting Spanish pottery. Right now that says uh, 70, I, I'd say we're probably closer to 100 now. So we're getting Spanish olive jar. And what olive jar, these really large amphora shaped vessels that are coming from Spain, probably initially having olive oil in it, but later grain and things like that. So they become these all purpose kinds of storage vessels. And so we see them really popular especially at mission sites, but we're really not at a mission site. There's no priest that's living here. We're also getting majolicas. I think we have five more pieces now. So this is over 10. Uh, we have two different types. This is San Luis blue on white. We have Sevilla blue on blue. They're early production dates. They're pre-1630. Um, these are tableware. So usually we don't see indigenous people with these. Usually when we see um, majolicas, the colonial wares, everyone thinks, oh, those are being made by the indigenous women for the priests and the other Spanish who are living at missions. Well, we're clearly at a site that is not a mission. So we see that the indigenous people themselves are incorporating some of these things into their own um, assembly. We wonder too now with so much of this olive jar, majolic and these other things, if this is a council house area, if this is an unusual assemblage. So our next thing to do is after we finish this area here is to start getting air, uh, kind of shellmans that may represent households that are further from the center, see what they have so we can really compare what's going on. This is in Mexican red painted. So this is probably actually being made in Mexico. Um, this pottery, this uh, majolica is probably being made in Spain. 
later Spanish will have um, pottery production centers in Mexico, but this is early. Here's the scabbard tip. Um, we, um, Chester de Prater and a few others have looked at it. Well, of course, we wondered if it was going to be French, but it, it's Spanish. Uh, this is just this last week. So it's more of the same. We're getting here's your San Pedro. Here's some more olive jar. Uh, here's some more of the um, reed punctate and some of the incised and stamped San Marcos. So that stuff is still coming in. Uh, here's, I think we have three or four shark teeth. So these are non fossilized shark teeth. Uh, this is part of that Welk Cayumela. You see, they they drilled a hole here and then they cut them. So they're in the process of making these uh, uh, Welk shell Cayumela beads. So this is kind of a production that's going on. We have a couple of these that are either complete or in various stage of production. And this is going to be our, our really kind of really unique find. You're the first ones to see it. This is probably our first uh, kind of. Um, Christian imagery that's made by indigenous people. So this is actually a, it appears to be a, a arc shell. And these little ridges that are here are actually the actual natural growth lines or ridges for the shell. Then they've taken, and they've worn them down over here and then they've incised this. So what you have is a central dot and it appears this is a cross. And then you have a central dot rays coming out of it. So I sent this to a, a, a Catholic, a specialist who looks at um, uh, Catholic imagery and stuff, and he feels really confident that this is a, a monstrance, which is what they uh, have the host in. And a lot of times when the host has been imbued, uh, consecrated by God, that's what the light represents. So these are, the, of course, these are not from where we are, but these kind of give you an idea of what we're looking at, something like this. So I think this is really something pretty, pretty impressive. It's really, really small, uh, great eyes on the part of the student who picked this out but it's really uh, pretty impressive. And when you turn it over on the other side, it's really thin and it's starting to flake. So I'm a little worried about it. We're trying to find a way now to conserve it better, but um, it's, um, it's impressive. Um, what I, I guess I want to leave you with is that you've probably seen this before. So everyone thinks this is what a Tumukwan village looks like. And what's interesting, DeSoto comes through the Tumukwa area, not our area of Tumukwa, but near the Gainesville area. He never talks about the Tumukums having a palisade or wall around their villages. None of the French do. The only mention of that is the heading below this. And De Bry is actually copying something that was done by a Frenchman in 1565. But we don't have that original one. And this looks really strongly like stuff that's coming from South America. Uh, Hans Staden, uh, John Deliri, all of those. So I would say to you, say no to these De Bry's that you see out there. And we think it's something more like this. This is still speculation on our part, but they're more linear. Their villages spread out along the salt marshes uh, and there'd be a central area, maybe with the council house, maybe the elites in the community living kind of around the periphery of it. They have a one single pole ball field and plaza area. And then what you might have are small households distributed over a broader area with their, with their fields and the like. All right, so I think I'm gonna end it there. Um, I get to be the mouthpiece for all these great UNF students who go out there and work really hardly, really hard for us. They come, they spend a couple of years out here, they probably go on and they never probably realize how great they're, how much of a contribution they're really making. So I wanna thank all the UNF students this year, last year, and the many years in the past. They come in and they do lab work. I have a lot of great partners that are helping me out there on Big Talbot Island from the state park to the Friends of Talbot Island, to the Tumukwan Parks Foundation, to the North Florida Land Trust, to one of the private landowners that have been out there. So there's been a lot of people that really have played a big part in what we do. So I just wanna uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Questions or comments? Oh, yeah. I got a question. Introduce yourself. Uh, yeah. He's the guy from Etowah. Yeah, I'm Ken A. Ken Aikens. I, I, I was the uh, manager at Etowah Mounds in Cartersville uh, for several years. Um, I know most of the tribes in Georgia at this time uh, were of Muscogean stock. They're, 
but I've never, I have never received an answer on the on the Tamukulans. Were they Muscogee, or where, what kind of language group were they? Well, uh, Aaron Aaron Broadwell, who's at the University of Florida. So what it is, we have a lot of letters that are out there, and the priest who wrote that letter I talked about in 1602, he also wrote a dictionary and a catechism for the Spanish. So what it is, it's written in Spanish, and then it's also written in Tamukwin. So there's about 2,000 pages of Tamukwin writing. What's really interesting, we've all thought that this priest was this great linguist, and that he was writing both the Spanish version and the indigenous version. That's not the case. There appears to be probably indigenous ghostwriters, because well, now that he can decipher and read the Tamukwin version, it's being filtered probably by a, a natural Tamukwin. So it's not exactly the way that it's being presented by, by the Spanish. So I asked Aaron as well, is it based on Muscogean or is it something else? And he still is not positive, but he thinks it's going to have some connection to Muscogean, but he doesn't want to call it Muscogean. So really, it's still kind of left up in the air. But he would be the one to do it. I think he has a book coming out soon on all the work he's been done doing on the Tamuka language. What was his name? Her name? I, last name is it's Aaron and Broadwell. B R O A D W E L L. Thank and he's you. a ling he's a linguist or a linguistic anthropologist, at the University of Florida. Aaron. Yep. I'm very, I'm very impressed with the uh, with the tremendous amount of background literary work you've done digging through the the uh, early records. Um, did you have a, a I don't know graduate students helping you do all this, or were you working with someone else's work? Or I'm just yeah, yeah. You've done a lot. You've done a lot. You really have. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not John Worth. I don't do paleography myself. So I, I rely on whoever's done the previous translation. So John Hand has done a lot of these translations. John Worth, John always helps me and sends stuff my way. Uh, so I don't I don't actually do any of the translations. I just read translated work. Um, Denise Bosey, who's at the University of North Florida, she specializes more in indigenous people uh, in the 17th and 16th century. So her and I are really kind of co uh, collaborating now. Uh, I'm really interested in this long-term indigenous history. So um, I really consider myself sometimes almost doing like long-term ethnography. I want to really know an area from the first arrival of the indigenous people all the way, you know, until the modern times. So um, um, I just have try you, to- Have you run across some of the work of John Worth who was studying that general area and time period some years ago? Yeah, yeah, John sends me stuff and turns me on to lots of things. So yes, he's a great asset. Yep. Yeah, so he's done all that stuff on from the Georgia coast down in the northeastern Florida. You know, um, abandoning with abandoning the Georgia coast. He has a couple of books out. So no, yeah, I build I build upon all their work. Fantastic. Now, really, my my interest is more pre-contact, but I I don't like having this arbitrary line that separates the contact and post-contact, pre-contact. I want to look at it as a continuum throughout. So I try to straddle both sides, but I do have to rely on the uh, work of a lot of historians. I think you do a good job of integrating them. I, I was impressed with the integration uh, of the prehistoric and the historic records um, tonight. Brother Company? That was fascinating. <laughs> Thanks, sir. I really appreciate it. That was awesome. Okay. Thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, kind of sharing uh, our research with you guys. If you're ever here in Jacksonville, come by UNF, the lab. You can see all these artifacts, or uh, we excavate behind me Mill Cove every January, and we have a field school every uh, uh, Summer A, which is roughly beginning of May to the end of June. So if you're ever down here, want to come out and visit us or work with us, you're welcome to. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Mill Cove, that would be great. January. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> January sounds real good to us.
Okay, yeah, come out to Mill Cove. I think we're planning to be out there. Just give me, uh, usually I, I check with him in late uh, November, early December, we can set it up. And he's usually back by then. We're usually doing on weekends because of, uh, you know, students to have classes and so forth. Hmm. Anyone else? Thank you so much, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Keith. Okay, guys. All Thank right. you. Have a good day. You do the same. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.